Hello, welcome to today's SPS On Conversations. Our topic is going to be working with the 3PL, all the things that you need to know. Today, we're going to hear from our peers at the Humble Company, UB, ShipBob, and ShipFusion, and they're going to share some insight and advice. My name is Danny Schmitz. I'm a sales trainer here at SPS. I'll be our host for today to make sure that we get all of your questions answered and that we get out with enough time to share a couple Guinnesses on this lovely St. Patrick's Day. Now, uh, we are having a panel going to come on in a second and they're going to answer some questions. And then at the end, we're going to have a live Q&A. So if you have any questions about anything, uh, feel free to throw those in the Q&A portion at the bottom of the screen. And we'll make sure to get to those questions at the end of our session with a live Q&A with our panel, which we're really, really excited about. And now before I bring the panel out uh, for you all to meet them, I want to take the temperature of the room a second, and, and uh, we're going to launch a quick poll to see what our experience is uh, with 3PL. So we're going to go ahead and launch this poll, and I'd love for you guys to answer. If you're using a 3PL today, and then if you're not using a 3PL, do you plan on using one in the next year? Give you guys a little bit of time to answer this poll. All right, give it a couple more seconds. And then if we end the poll, we'll be able to see some of the results here. Looks like a bunch of us are using a 3PL today. 80% of us are using a 3PL. And then of those that are not, it looks like a good percentage of the ones that are not using a 3PL, you're looking at using one in the next year. So that makes me really excited about the conversation that we're about to have with all of these fantastic experts in their field. So with that, let's bring on our panelists here and get to meet them uh, before we jump into our conversation. With us today, we have Collier Hansen, who is a senior manager of tech oper operations at UB, an office and school supplier company. It's great to have you here, Collier. Great to be here. We also have Amar Hotic, the Director of Operations at the Humble Company in North America, a supplier of innovative and eco-friendly health and wellness products. Welcome, Amar. Hi, Danny. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. And we have Wojtek Gajinski, the S Director of Sales at ShipFusion, an e-commerce order fulfillment company. Hello, Wojtek. Hi, Danny. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, great to see everybody. And then our last panelist is Kevin Marvinak, the Vice President of Partnerships at ShipBob, a logistics provider for e-commerce and B2B brands. Hi, Kevin. Hey, folks. Thanks for having me. And then finally, from uh, Team SPS, we have Wes Aronson, the Manager of our Logistics Sales here at SPS, who's going to help guide today's discussion. Welcome, Wes. Thank you, Danny. Happy to have everyone here. So with that, Wes, I'm going to hand it off to you to lead a, a lovely discussion with our wonderful panelists, and I will see you for the live Q&A at the end. All right. Thank you, Danny. Um, we're excited to have everyone here. I'm um, looking forward to today, today's discussion. Um, if you, as you may have noticed, uh, Bonnie, um, who was supposed to join the panel, was unable to join us, unfortunately, due to a last-minute conflict. So uh, we wish her well, uh, but today we'll have these four uh, sharing some time with us. So we're very excited. So Danny gave a brief, a brief overview of this group, but I'm going to have everybody just give a little more in-depth overview of who they are and what their company does uh, from their perspective. So Collier, let's start with you. Sure thing. Hi, everybody. Collier Hansen. I am here at UB. Uh, UB, we design and sell fun and creative school and art supplies for kids and families. Our motto at UB is you buy and UB gives, which means that for every UB item purchased, we donate a school supply item to a child in need here in the U.S., uh, as senior manager of tech operations, I manage all of our integrations here at UB, including EDI. So I work closely with my partners at SPS on a weekly basis, launching new retailers, refining connections, and constantly looking for new ways to delight our customers, direct and retail. Great. Amar, let's go to you. Yes. Hi, hi everyone. Again, my name is Amar. Uh, I've been at the Humble Company for five years now, pretty much uh, ever since the company started uh, in the U.S. Uh, for those who don't know, the Humble Company makes uh, eco-friendly oral care and wellness products. 
Um, all of our all care products are developed by dentists. The founder of the company himself is a dentist. Um, yeah, uh, I've been the head of the operations and supply uh, chain team for uh, a little bit over two years now. Um, and uh, originally I was doing sales with the company. So yeah, very, again, very nice uh, to be here and excited. Thank you, Omar. Uh, Wojtek. Yeah, thanks, Russ. Hi, my name is Wojtek Kijinski uh, from ShipFusion. Uh, so I, I oversee our sales and partnership efforts at ShipFusion. Um, and ShipFusion is a tech-first 3PL and fulfillment platform, um, and we're built by e-commerce experts. Um, so as, as the tech-first kind of 3PL, we're, we're definitely tech-forward, so powered by our own proprietary tech stack, uh, which means we can integrate in, uh, to a whole host of technologies, you know, starting from, from Shopify to, to various ERP systems, obviously to EDI with, uh, with a support and working alongside SPS. And then all the way through to some custom APIs um, that support our, our direct to consumer and B2B clients. Thank you. And Kevin. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Kevin Marvinak, VP of Partnerships at ShipBob, uh, coming at you from Northern California near Sacramento. I, uh, ShipBob is, is a, a tech enabled 3PL as well. Um, we have 35 locations globally across six countries. And really, what we do is work with e commerce brands that want sort of that Amazon level experience, the two day shipping that is now table stakes, but they want to do it for their brand. They want, they want to own their experience in some way and some sort of customization. Um, so whether it's custom packaging, gift notes, serial scan, lot management, all that stuff that's custom, we, we sort of do that. That's where we slot in. And we have a great um, B2B program as well with SPS powering all of that. Great. Thank you, Kevin. All right, we will get started here. So as you see, we have you know, two, two brands represented, two 3PLs represented to get both sides of the fence on uh, this overall relationship and how each can improve um, and work best together. So with that, I'm going to start a, with a question more for the brands. Um, so there's one thing we can all agree on. It's that supply chains are complex. They're, they're very stressed right now. Um, they're changing quickly in today's omni-channel world. So oftentimes suppliers see that partnering with the 3PL is the answer to that. So for Collier and Amar, how is partnering with the 3PL helped in that world and in sort of responding to some of these changing requirements and the complexities that come along with this? Collier, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so we, we enjoy our 3PL partnership um, for a lot of reasons. One of the main reasons is that they allow us to focus on what we do best and they take care of the rest. So we're allowed to focus on creating and designing and selling and marketing all these wonderful products and helping kids in need and you know, doing what our brand does best. And when it comes to pick, pack, ship, packing guides, palletizing, organizing shipments, we just hand that to them and they they deal with it. They are experts in it. They do it for tons of different brands. And it means that when we onboard a new retailer, we can focus on the relationship with the retailer and any packing guides or routing guides or, you know, labeling guides, whatever it is, we can just send that right onto our 3PL and they they handle it. They understand it. They understand those 20 page PDFs of all of the different label requirements. They've got a whole system to do it. It lets us not worry about it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I only agree with you, Collier. So for us, it's exactly the same thing. When we came, uh, started the company in the US, uh, our main focus was only selling, selling, selling the products. We just wanted to be in retail and e-commerce. So, you know, having a 3PL by our side, uh, that partnership uh, just made things easier for us uh, to focus on exactly what Collier said, what we do best. So we create those products, we make them, you know, we sell them, but we have our 3PL that knows all that, um, that part of shipping, of routing guides, of packing guides, and how to make the pallets, how to make all those things, uh, uh, all to meet all the requirements that uh, each retailer uh, needs. So yeah, absolutely, I totally agree. Right. And I'll, I'll turn this question around a little bit. I know uh, Wojtek and, and Kevin, you're, you're biased in this category, but just maybe tell us what are the most impactful ways that you see this relationship benefiting your customers? Uh, Wojtek, maybe start with you. Yeah, definitely. It's um, I think the the way to approach the the brand 3PL relationship is definitely as a partnership and, and an extension, especially the 3PL being an extension of the brand. Um, and, and those are the most successful relationships that we see where 
Um, you know, there's there's a lot of coordination and cooperation, frequent communication. Um, brands are sharing their forecasts and their projections. You know, three PLs are potentially sharing something that hey, we we were working on this product and we noticed something. Um, uh, that might not be right, or that might be off, um, or a brand might not have that visibility if they're not actually holding each product every day in and day out. So that that partnership mentality is is you know what really what we strive to achieve with our clients versus a pure kind of supplier vendor relationship. Kevin, any anything you want to add to that? No, nothing to add. Wojtek nailed it. It's an extension of the brand. That's the key thing. You can't look at the three PL as as a, a just a, a service vendor of one part of your stack, you have to look at them as a partner. Right. All right. And so now a question more focused on the 3PL side of the equation. So we know that allocating inventory is never easy, especially given today's you know disrupted supply chains. Um, so what role can a 3PL play in helping to allocate inventory either between channels or um, even just in terms of managing some of those um, disruptions that may occur in the supply chain. So Kevin, why don't you start us off? Yeah, yeah, this is a great question because there, there are kind of two paradigms on this emerging in the market right now that I see. Um, one is sort of the Amazon way where Amazon FBA, I mean, where it's sort of, you just give us your inventory, we'll take care of the rest. Trust us that it's optimized. You don't have any choice in the matter. We're sort of going to do it all for you, um, which has its pros and cons. Uh, and the other is sort of more of a data-driven approach where the merchant still is in the driver's seat, but they are empowered with all the dials and, and metrics and things that they need to make those decisions. And so if those are the two paradigms, or if it's a spectrum with those are the two extremes, where we try to fall is somewhere in the middle. For brands that are smaller or maybe less sophisticated in terms of their supply chain management, we are super happy to manage their inventory for them, uh, move it around for them, help them cross dock you know, make it easy basically, but then they lose a little bit of control. They don't, they don't get to pick where their inventory is, um, but it's a little bit easier for them. For brands that have, are a little bit more sophisticated, who have, who are lucky enough to have people like Collier or MR working for them, who are optimizing, actively optimizing their, you know, their relationships with their suppliers um, and maybe want a little bit more control, we can do that too. And we have a data science team that, you know, empowers them, with uh, optimized inventory reports, how many zones they're going to be shipping for direct to consumer, where their optimal location for pallet storage for B2B is, you know, all that stuff is provided to you. So if your partner's not providing that, you know, it might be something to ask. Uh, Wojtek? Yeah, I think, um, you know, a similar approach uh, to, the, to what Kevin just described. I think, you know, it's a, it's definitely a very brand specific question. So it's hard to give a very broad answer that, that will encompass everybody because each brand's you know, goals and strategies are, are slightly different. But um, we, we echo the, the sentiment of, you know, taking a very data driven approach to, to and working with brands, um, you know, through our account managers to, to figure out a strategy that's right for them. And then that's kind of the consultative part of the process that 3PLs can and should play um, in, in helping brands make these decisions. Uh, in, in Collier and Omar, I'm curious on, on your take on this in, in terms of how do you, do you let your 3PL handle that for you? Do you take more control over that or is it somewhere in the middle? I would say it's somewhere in the middle. Um, so for our, for our Amazon FBA, if you want to call that a 3PL, uh, it's exactly how Kevin said, which is that we just kind of ship them the inventory and they distribute it and deal with it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's got its plus and minuses. It's nice that we don't have to worry about it, but the customer experience is not as controlled, which we don't like as much. Um, and then for our 3PL, for our, our retailers, for our, our palletized shipments, we work with them very closely. So it's a, it's a partnership that we have built over the last, with them for the last three years now. Um, so we work, we have weekly meetings. We plan out our, our, the amount of sales we're expecting to get, the amount of, you know, overtime we might need. Um, we work with them very closely. Yeah. Similar to us, I would say uh, we used to, I'm talking pre-COVID here, we used to work a lot with our 3PL to, you know, look at forecasts, make forecasts with them uh, using our system as well to have uh, not too much inventory and not too little to really be somewhere in, in a good spot. But unfortunately, COVID 
and supply chain disruptions have uh, you know disrupted the whole everything related to supply chains and operations so uh, now we try to keep uh, more inventory than usual and uh, we have to there's no you know there's no way to go around it uh, it's you have to do it if you want to um, not run out of stock you still want to keep growing in sales so that definitely has been disrupted and uh, but we always still work with our 3pl making sure yeah you know that they can have the space for us if we ship uh, you know say pre covid we would ship 50000 units now we're looking at 150000 units um and so it's it's always that uh, what i think kevin and Wojtek also mentioned it's always that partnership right you have to be on top of your communications you have to let them know this is coming in is it feasible is it okay this is what we're expecting to ship out in these following months um and at the end you know just uh, find the best solution for both parties got it okay uh, if i can just add a, yeah. a little bit to that the, i think Go it's on. really interesting how you know i sort of painted maybe a more black and white picture than actually happens because things change it's logistics it's an exceptions driven business and we're in ecom i mean talk about one of the most rapidly evolving fields that exists right now right. so you know a, a brand like amars right now might say hey i'd rather manage my own inventory because i'm making specific choices but then six months on the line maybe their business changes a little bit and maybe they want to move more towards that amazon model where it's managed by their partner almost entirely. So I think it's important to note that like, even though those are the two approaches and they're probably fairly dichotomous, a brand at any given time in its life cycle might choose to do one or the other. So when you're selecting a partner, make sure that you're vetting out not just what you need today, but what you might want to do in the future and, and how flexible they are with, with adhering to that. Um, and then the next thing I'd say that, that I think Amar alluded to, which is like, you're, you're only as a 3PL is only as good as its service level. You cannot exceed no matter how many capabilities and how much automation, how much great stuff you have, if you're not helping and, and partnering with your brands to work with them on any customization or any changes in their business, like Amar saying, I need to give you 3x the amount of inventory I thought I'd give you. If you're not able to work with them on that, then it's going to be a tough relationship. Absolutely. Yep. Got it. And, and so maybe taking a look at the other side of this uh, the equation, sort of, you know, we talk about getting inventory in, storing it, uh, managing that. Now, once an order is pick packed, next step obviously is shipping. Um, today's shipping costs can quickly get out of control, uh, eat into margins um, and make business much less profitable. So how are you mitigating these costs for yourself? And I guess in uh, Voitek and Kevin's case for your customers. So Collier, maybe can you start us off in terms of how, how do you approach shipping costs and making sure that you're um, keeping those under control? Sure. Um, so there's really two, there's really two different types of orders that we have to con that we're concerned with when it comes to costs. There's our e-commerce direct orders and then our retailer bulk orders. So for the, the direct orders, a lot of that cost is going to come down to the carrier. So we found one of the biggest, one of the biggest benefits we found, uh, we were stuck into a, a UPS, a UPS account that we just used for just about everything for as long as I can remember. Uh, and somebody asked the question, why don't we try shopping around other carriers, we found that switch to DHL parcel plus or DHL parcel e-commerce, e something like that, uh, saved like 50% on our fulfillment since we're shipping, you know, $3, two packs of pens. Uh, so on the e-commerce side, just reevaluating our carriers, depending on the kinds of orders that we're sending out has been the biggest benefit for us. Uh, for our retail orders, for our, our bulk orders, having SPS as our EDI connection between NetSuite, our ERP, and our 3PL means that when we send orders to our, our 3PL, we know that they're complete, that they're accurate, they've got all the details they need, that it matches exactly what we're expecting, what we have in our system, which means that when they provide us with an estimate for shipping, so for if we are paying for the shipping and we have to decide if it's going to be ground or next day or whatever that is, we know that that estimate is accurate and we can plan for that and make changes where necessary. Yeah, if I can add there, so we what you mentioned, Collier, you have UPS, we use FedEx a lot. So we've had a partnership with FedEx for a long time. 
And we try to ship everything that's ground with FedEx, sometimes also, you know, freight if it's LTL. Uh, but luckily, our uh, 3PL here again has been a great partner. They have this, um, they have a, a brokerage uh, department in, within the 3PL that helps us, you know, uh, leverage every single, I think, I don't know how many they have. They probably have 10 by now. Uh, so it's companies like XPO, YRC, and you name them. And they look at every single quote and basically, you know, who can do it for the best price. And um, of course, we're looking at lead times as well. And then, you know, they get back to us and say, hey, we have X, Y, Z. The costing is X, Y, Z. If, you know, sometimes it's a day more and it costs you $200 less. So uh, we always honestly try to go with the, the, I would say the cheapest option because that's uh, what makes sense for us knowing that all our products are, you know, we're not selling very expensive products being in the oral care industry. So um, uh, we are a little bit price sensitive. So we do look at all those other carriers and then, you know, decide the same day within the next hours or so once we receive them. All right, let's, let's move with this carrier, you know, and then we'll of course let also the customer know, hey, FYI, uh, if there's an appointment needed, we do it with them as well. Uh, or actually, but the 3PL helps us with that as well. So they do all that uh, appointments for us. So there you go. Got it. And yeah, Wojtek, maybe start us off on the 3PL lens of this equation. How do you help customers manage that? Yeah, definitely. I think the sort of we take a step back is, you, you know, brands or it's important for brands to know what their shipping strategy is before kind of diving into the weeds of, of rates and carriers and service levels, et cetera. It's shipping is a spectrum and it's a cost versus speed spectrum. So it's important to know where on that spectrum you want to fall and, and how it aligns with your business model and different kinds of businesses and different kinds of sales strategies will align better with, with various different points on that spectrum. Um, so that, that's an important, that's an important point to know and an important discussion to have, you know, internally and, and with your 3PL as well, who can provide some guidance and consultation on, on, you know, where other companies that are, that are similar to yours might, might be, uh, might be going with, or, or what might be the best for, for your particular brand. Um, and then once you get into, you know, on the small parcel side, obviously there, there's lots of service levels between, between various carriers, um, for us, as as a as a three PL, we're you know we have some tech builds out. For example, a rate shop where if a customer pre-selects or opts into several different service levels across multiple carriers, um, our tech can actually rate shop each and every individual shipment to find the best rate based on that that size, that weight, the destination zip. So that, that that's one way we do that on the small parcel side. Um, on the B2B side, um, sort of similar to, I think, what Amar was saying that, that his current 3PL does, we also have an in-house freight team. Um, they can book freight. They can look across multiple freight uh, freight partners, uh, come back with, with various options. Again, that speed versus cost spectrum comes up again. And then, you know, it's up to the client to decide, do they need to get that, you know, that truckload into a vendor tomorrow? Or is is there more lead time, or is or is the a more uh, cost effective option the best uh, the best fit in this case? And Kevin, maybe add on to that uh, if you have any thoughts. Yeah, I, I think about this in terms of like there's really three vectors that we think about when we think about cost savings for our clients. Number one is distribution of inventory. So we, we really overemphasize distribution of inventory, like physical distribution among multiple shipping nodes. I've talked with several brands that have been hesitant because it increases complexity, of course. But I mean, the idea of having bi-coastal nodes or, or even better, you have bi-coastal in the US plus Northern US like Chicago, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and then a Southern US node to serve Texas. Um, I mean, we're, we're talking about for a, a one to two pound package average for D2C, you can save multiple dollars, multiple dollars for every shipment. So the minute you start hitting velocity as a brand where you're doing 500 to 1,000 plus D2C shipments a month, you're gonna start seeing those benefits. And I, I promise you with all the technology we have in our modern democratized world, there is a way to do that without complexity breaking, breaking your brand. You can, you can do it with a professional 3PL. It will be a slightly more complex to manage or you can give the keys to them and have them manage it and it won't, it won't ruin your business. So don't be too afraid of it, explore it. The second thing that we talk about is carrier shopping. Um, Wojtek already kind of mentioned that's it should be algorithmic, it should be automated. If you're not carrier shopping, chances are you're leaving some money on the table. Regional carriers in particular with direct-to-consumer have risen in prominence lately. I have a feeling that 
we're going to be talking about regional carriers in the next three to five years in a really, um, it's going to be much more prominent in the world of e-commerce. I think the regionals are going to start doing better and better. Or there's going to be consolidation or both. Um, the other thing is arbitrage. We haven't talked about that. If you're a smaller brand, or maybe you're a bigger brand, but you just don't do a lot of D2C, a 3PL can arbitrage for you, right? They can use their volume to negotiate carrier rates and pass those on to you. So if you're not like Amar, if you're not lucky enough to be like Amar and have sweetheart rates with FedEx, um, your 3PL can help with that and they should. Um, and then finally, there's like, so those are the three vectors that we always think of, but then there's this other bucket of like everything else that's brand specific. Like I've talked with brands that are having problems with dimensional weight and we work with them to get custom boxes that are a little bit smaller on all sides and just fit their product. And that can save them $5 a shipment depending on the size, right? There are other tactics around pre-kitting bundles. There are tactics around shipping on container stuff from the manufacturer. There's a litany of, of things that you can do if you have an expert looking at your brand and working with you on your specific issues. And that's what you're buying with a 3PL. You're not buying just the shipping and logistics. You're buying that, of course, but you're buying the partnership ideally. And, and those that's where those like proactive recommendations can come into play. Yeah, I'll 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 add to that because that's that reminded me. We we actually had a client recently who who had 16 and a half ounce packaging um for for it's a non-perishable food product. And I asked them, you know, what's what's the thought process behind 16 and a half? And it was just the way we've always done things. And then you know, we explained to them how how shipping works under a pound, and it really you know sparked the light bulb in their eye and like wow, we can you know take an ounce off this package and save a whole host of money on on actual shipping because that that demarcation between under a pound and over a over a pound is is quite steep in a lot of cases, so it, it is very much that partnership mentality again is is working with your three PL as a as a consultant. Yeah, that's a great point. And it, so one thing before we move on, um, there there is a, a Q and A section, so feel free as we're going through to think of something throw it out there and we'll make sure we answer that at the end. Um, but getting into the next question. So as we all know, uh, there's a ton of uh, talk in the industry around the labor shortage. Um, it's certainly impacting all businesses. Um, it's something that is not going to go away anytime soon from what I understand. So I'm curious, I guess, first from the, the brand perspective, how has having a 3PL helped you navigate the, the labor shortage that we're currently seeing? Um, Amar, maybe we'll start with you on this one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so luckily, our 3PL has not, they did not have any problems with that recently. Uh, I don't know how they did it, but uh, we sometimes do or make some special projects, say it's like a bundling for some of our products, if we're selling them to a specific retailer or maybe e-commerce. Uh, what we do is we also mostly talk to the retailer or to that e-commerce platform, make sure, you know, to extend some lead times. We know that our 3PL would most of the time make, say, uh, I don't know, a bundle of maybe toothpaste, toothbrush, and a mouthwash uh, together in three to four days, saying, you know, 500 units. But we always make sure to tell, you know, the other party that's receiving the products, hey, you will most probably, it will take a little bit more time, say 10 days. So we always keep that little lead time for the 3PL and for ourselves uh, to make sure that at the end of the day, they still receive it uh, by the time we told them they will receive it. And also we give a little bit of, let's say, slack to you know our 3PL and not forcing them to make everything super quick. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they also talk to us all the time. So they let it, they let us know, Hey, you know, we, we have a shortage of people. If you have some, some special project you want to make for next month or, you know, for, I don't know, three months from now, just please let us know, especially if it's big quantities. So again, it goes back to really like the original part that we were saying is partnering with your 3PL and that communication, constant communication, just letting them know ahead. Um, right now we have, uh, I don't know, four, five, six containers that arrive almost every month. So it's very important to let them know in advance. Also, hey guys, this is coming in, uh, you know, hundred something thousand units are coming in. So just heads up. Uh, and again, just, just keeping them informed. So to avoid this kind of problem. Um, and then if it's an extreme really uh, labor shortage, uh, I think still the, the only solution here is just to let them know in advance, this is what's going on please be prepared. So they can also do that on their end and prepare as well. Yeah, I think that during the height of the labor shortages, uh, we having that direct partnership, that really tight partnership with our 3PL helped mm -hmm. us manage it a lot. It was a balancing act between 
getting orders to our retailers on in the time frame that they had originally requested, but also managing the own our own costs for overtime. I mean, they they were very good at communicating with us about their own staffing levels and where overtime might be necessary to get the work done. Um, but more importantly for us right now, we're a very seasonal business. I mean, our back to school is basically our Black Friday. So we we know that our 3PL knows that. So everybody can plan their labor around that and know that, you know, hey, I'm <laughs> in January, uh, our entire inventory for the entire year is coming in uh, in a couple days. So make sure you got enough staff for that day. So having that that direct partnership and that communication is absolutely necessary. Got it. And and I feel like this question is a bit of a layup for the, the 3PL crowd in terms of the, the labor shortage. But if, if you guys want to comment just on kind of what you've seen as far as benefits to your customers or maybe even some specific challenges that they've had around, you know, trying to do this themselves. Kevin, you want to start this one? Yeah, I guess the overarching thing I'd say is if you're already working with the 3PL, their labor issues should not be your issues. I mean, we exist in some way to obfuscate the challenges of fulfillment from you. So if you're feeling the pain or if you're getting... I don't want to say excuses, that seems derogatory, but if you if you don't feel like you're getting um, taken care of in that regard, um, you know, I, I think that's probably a, a bad signal. Um, in terms of like specific tactics though, I really like what Amara said about just communication. That's like what 99% of this comes down to. And it's not the most complicated thing in the world to conceptualize, but it's very hard to get right. Just communicate. You know, if you have a, if you have a sale coming up or if you know your business is extremely seasonal, the difference between telling us as a 3PL partner, you know, three to five days in advance, hey, this is coming. We might, it might be 2,000 units extra. It might be 10,000. We don't know. The difference between doing that, even with imperfect information and not doing that, could be three, four days of SLAs. I mean, it, it could be massive. So we always see that just proactive communication is, is better. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Kevin that it, it, for the most part, and I think we've heard it here from from everyone from from the three PL side and, and from the brand side that you know, as a as a brand, if you're working with a with a reputable three PL, you really shouldn't be too concerned about their staffing levels. And, and generally, that's something that we you know that's our responsibility. And we take care of uh, on our operations on our back end and, and what we were responsible for on the partnership. Um, but definitely, you know, again, another another case of communication, 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 and and working this as a relationship together. Um, you know, we're used to working with level spiking volumes and spiking um, different um, frequencies of sales across different brands. But the more you can work with us, and the more that brands can tell us uh, as three PLs in, in general, that you know, the better we're able to succeed, and the better we're able to to accomplish what it is that we do. Got it. And and I think to follow up on that, I know you just said most of this is communication, but. Each one of you has a different process, different technology you're using um, to facilitate the relationship between the brand and the 3PL. So I'm curious just to get a sense for what kind of unique systems, what is your setup to make sure that you and your 3PL or your 3PL and your customer are talking and, and uh, using technology to facilitate that relationship. So Collier, do you want to start um, just talking through that? Yeah, uh, so not to not to uh, press the, the issue here too much, but SPS, uh, has been the biggest benefit for this. So our our process is very straightforward. With any new retailer, um, one of the best advantages of having SPS as our partner for EDI is that using their web portal means that any new retailer, 99% of the time, SPS is already set up with them. So when we when we start that conversation with sales, they say, hey, we got to do EDI. We say, perfect, we're ready to go. And we get them set up in the web portal in a few days which means that from the retailer, from our customer side, from their perspective, we're EDI compliant, everything looks great. They can send us orders, they can get their ASNs, they, we can invoice them, no problem. And we're able to do that very quickly. So our process is we get the retailer set up on the web portal, get everything happy there. And then we add that retailer to our queue for integrating into our ERP NetSuite and then integrating to our 3PL. So it allows us to quickly respond and give the customer a good experience and then also eventually <laughs> integrate for that connectivity and that that seamless integration yeah similar to us for the humble co i would say uh, edi and having sps as a partner is of course uh, amazing you know we have target we have uh, hannaford we have so many even distributors like kehi 
connected to uh, SPS. And that's usually the first thing we discuss when you start a partnership, because you don't want to be entering manual orders every time. So having someone, you know, set up as EDI at SPS, that, that's just perfect. And then what we do is we have uh, our own system. So we use a NetSuite system where everything is connected. So we have connected SPS with our NetSuite system, and that is also connected to our warehouse. So there is just uh, an easy flow basically between the order and the warehouse. So say an EDI order, you know, goes to SPS. It's also sent in our NetSuite system. So we have a track record of the sales order. And then we also have a, a track record with the, the 3PL, which they fulfill, they, you know, ship it out. We actually get a notification back in our NetSuite system saying this has been shipped out. Here's the tracking information. It's a little bit more, I would say a little bit complex, but everything can be done, of course, uh, with the NetSuite system. So uh, yeah, definitely we use, I would say those are our main, main, main connectors. So EDI, NetSuite, and then our 3PL and everything is just uh, interconnected. And from the 3PL side of the fence, Kevin, maybe start us on this, this one. What, what types of technologies do you find most beneficial um, in connecting with your customers? Yeah, so I think there's uh, the, the critical path connectivity, which, which Amar kind of mentioned, is, is first of all crucial to get right. Like for us, when we think about partnering with SPS Commerce um, to power all of our EDI compliance, we're not, the benefit that we're getting is of course the connectivity, but anyone can connect if you have a developer and a couple of APIs, that, that's not the secret sauce. The secret sauce is it's thousands of connections plus the compliance management. And we can have so much confidence that if it comes through SPS, it's good, right? That, I mean, that's really the secret sauce that we see. And that's why we selected you guys as, as our partner. Um, so th those are like the critical path things. And I think those are essential. Those are table stakes. But what I would encourage brands to think about when it comes to connectivity is the stuff beyond the critical path. So think about your customer service tool. Presumably you have one. I'm guessing you're using Zendesk, Gorgeous, those types of things. Does that connect with your 3PL? Can it connect with your 3PL? Can you get real-time order fulfillment status info at the point where your reps are actually answering questions? Can you get proactive information into a Klaviyo or other ESP if you use like a MailChimp or something like that? Um, those things are, are typically not thought of because they're not on the critical path when you're vetting out 3PLs. But I think what, that's an area that we in particular have chosen to invest a lot in because we realize it saves all this time. You know, if you have uh, if you have an inventory forecasting tool, let's say like Inventory Planner, you might be spending hours, sometimes 15, 20 hours a week as a director of operations for an e-com company, getting manually created forecasts into your 3PL with POs and things like that. With a, with a connection there, even though it's not that critical path order connection, it still might save you a ton of time and, and create a ton of value. So think beyond just the critical path as well. And the last thing I'd say is, you know, a 3PL that's a little bit more tech forward, like Ship Fusion, and Voita can talk more about this, or like Ship Bob or whoever, you're going to be able to have that glass box visibility. We always talk about the glass box visibility. You should always be able to log into a portal somewhere and know where your inventory is, how much is there, and what's going on with it, what status is it in. If you can't do that, if you're doing manual Excel spreadsheets and you're doing emails or you're doing phone calls, God forbid, to your 3PL, that's probably a time to, to modernize. Um, yeah, I, not much to add here. I think everyone's covered it pretty well. Definitely on the EDI side, um, you know, SPS is is uh, the, the grease that makes the wheel turn. Um, I'll, I'll say it that way. Um, there's so many complexities on, on the connections and the compliance side, as, as Kevin mentioned, to connect to all these, you know, thousands of different retailers that that's definitely the 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 most sane path forward. Um, and so that that's why we, we've chosen SPS as well. Uh, and then sort of outside of the EDI route. Yeah, it's, it's exactly the same thing. It's you know making automate as much as possible, um, both on the the order management, sort of importing and exporting of, of any data and, and then also, you know, communication with with customer support or account management uh, at your 3PL and, and having multiple routes of, of available to you to kind of just suit the way that you want to work. Got it. Yeah, thank you all for that. So we've spent most of our time today talking about what you should do and, and how you should work together. So let's let's flip that on its head and then look at how, what things should you avoid when working at with the 3PL or what are some pitfalls that maybe you've seen come in the way of a successful relationship? Um, Collier, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, I think one of the biggest pitfalls is thinking that EDI is not necessary. <laughs> we've had a couple we had a couple of retailers we've onboarded 
where we weren't expecting that many orders. And so we figured, you know, we'll just, we'll just manage, we'll manage it manually. It'll be fine. And what you realize very quickly is that every step in a non-automated process is an opportunity for error. Anytime a person is involved, anytime a spreadsheet changes hands, it is you are asking for errors because there's no validation, there's no double checking, there's no there's no give and take on that information to make sure it's correct. So even for those even for those those one off retailers, you know sometimes we can't justify the cost to to add it to EDI, but you know that when we're <laughs> you get really used to EDI and you get really used to the the simplicity. And as Kevin said, that you know, knowing that it's going to be correct, knowing that the information is going to come in correct, it's going to go out correct, it's going to be compliant, all of those things, you 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 start to realize that not using EDI is uh, is can be an absolute nightmare. Um, for us specifically, when it comes to using EDI, the biggest pitfall we ran into was trying to move too fast. Um, so we we started onboarding a ton of new retailers. We started adding too many to the pipeline that we were trying to integrate at once. And for a small team like ours, even working with a great partner like SPS, just managing all of those different connections and all those different uh, pipeline integrations and where they were in the testing process became a nightmare and ended up probably taking more time than it would have had we just done them you know, one or two at a time in quick succession. Um, I would say on the humble co side, uh, when we're looking for a 3PL, uh, of course, the, one of the main things is, are, can they be integrated with SPS? Uh, other things were, uh, we asked for references, for instance. We were like, uh, you know, who are some of your biggest clients that you have? Can we talk to them and see what the relationship has been so far? Uh, and then we also looked at the future. We were, I would say, very uh, retail-oriented in the beginning. We wanted to be in all the stores. So are they capable of working with a Kroger? Are they capable of working with a Target? Are they capable of working with a Walmart? So knowing all these little things that each of these retailers is going to ask, uh, can they actually do it? And then same with like Amazon. Are you guys able to fulfill, you know, make pallets specifically for Amazon? Do you know how to make their packing list? And if, although we weren't doing it back then. And then uh, we also asked, for instance, oh, we want to launch our own Shopify. Do you guys have... Uh, any way to you know reduce maybe the cost of pick packing all the Shopify orders because you, you don't want to be paying the same cost you're paying for a full box of products when you're picking maybe one toothbrush and one mouthwash. So uh, luckily the three PLs that we talked to and then we made our decision with our current three PL is they had all those little things uh, broken down and they were like, yep, we have uh, we if it's Shopify we take it from this specific region and so. The units are, for example, in the basket, they're not full cases. And uh, that helped us also, you know, control that cost a little bit. Uh, but overall, it's just, again, just looking at, uh, I would say we looked at what we want to be able to do now and also what we look for the future. So also for the size of the 3PL, uh, in the beginning, we had maybe 60,000 units uh, with, you know, I don't know how many, 10 SKUs maybe. Now we have over 50 SKUs and we, almost hold over 2 million units. Uh, so it's very important to also look on that side of the 3PL that uh, it can be a 3PL that can grow with you and help you grow, uh, you know, with space, with uh, fulfilling multiple orders at the same time, uh, whether it's, you know, one small box with, you know, three couple of inners or five pallets at once that are shipping out the same day. So uh, just uh, to th something to think about to avoid is really have that full on conversation, ask as many questions as you can, you know, look at what they offer, what kind of pricing they offer, what kind of uh, services they offer. Uh, do you have a, a dedicated maybe account manager that will work with you on a day to day basis? Um, so those are a couple of things that, you know, we look for to avoid uh, working with someone that, you know, in a couple of months will have to change. Uh, I would say, yeah. That, that sums it up, I'd say, uh, pretty well, <laughs> at least on our end. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, thank you. So, and real quickly, just as a, you know, we're getting towards the end here, I want to throw that same question to Boytek and Kevin, just to get a sense for what, from the 3PL perspective, what types of things would you avoid? What are some pitfalls you've seen um, that's made the relationship either more stressful than it needed to be, or maybe uh, even unsuccessful? Uh, Boytek, maybe start with this one. 
Yeah, I think Amar led into this really nicely because he talked about how he talked to his 3PL before he selected them about everything that they wanted to do. And I think that's key. The relationship should start before the contract is signed. You know, the relationship should start with, with that exploratory phase, with, with really, you know, being clear with this is what we need. Um, here's the data that we have to support it, you know, sharing that data, um, getting some feedback um, and potentially like being open to new ideas of how best to approach the, the specific fulfillment, um, you know, I wouldn't say problem in a bad sense, but the specific fulfillment case that, that your specific brand has. So it's, you know, kind of the, you know, the, the theme of partnership should start early on. Um, and, and being transparent and, you know, the, we love to solve problems. I think, you know, Kevin probably can, can echo this, like fulfillment people love to sol solve problems. They're operations people, that is what they do. Um, and so we, we very much welcome, welcome these kinds of um, conversations early on. Um, and, you know, the, the reputable 3PLs that you work with will be transparent with, with what they can and they can't do. They might push back on some things. Um, and it's just a matter of finding the right fit for, for your brand and your use case and, and where you are now and where you want to go in the future. So, you know, the, to, to kind of sum this up is, um, you know, start that partnership from, from the first conversation and, and continue that. And then you should have a successful relationship that can last years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I won't, I won't belabor that point um, because that's been well, well made and I totally agree with it. I would say the other elements that I might think about in regards to if you're a brand looking at a 3PL or you're looking at maybe switching 3PLs, number one, think about outsourcing the expertise you don't have. A lot of brands come to us, for example, when they wanna go international, that's like a big value proposition that we help with. So, so ask questions about, you know, hey, are you guys gonna help me with VAT compliance or do you have partners that you subcontract with that, that will? Are you gonna help with ocean freight? Are you gonna help with, making sure I know how my third Shopify storefront for Germany is going to thread into my same order management software, right? Like ask those proactive questions and ask them if they'll help you. And a lot of times they will, but sometimes certain 3PLs don't have that infrastructure. So think about outsourcing the expertise that you don't have, but you might need. The second thing is um, just underlining Amar's point, do your homework. Do not be afraid to ask for references. This like 3PLs, we sell logistics, but we sell trust really. I mean, at the end of the day, we have your physical inventory. That's like for a lot of brands, it's like giving your baby to somebody, you know, you want to make sure it's taken care of, do your homework. Um, the next thing that I always think about is like hidden fees. People talk about hidden fees with 3PLs a lot. It's kind of a bad rap that our industry has gotten. So, so ask about potential for hidden fees, ask about potential for surcharges and all of those things. Some 3PLs do kind of like all in pricing. Some do like line item pricing. So just ask them proactively about that. And then I guess there's one more thing that I'd say is um, when you think about a 3PL in terms of like all your other vendors, uh, whether it's SPS Commerce, whether it's a sales channel, like a Shopify or a, or a retailer that you have a relationship with, or even like other tech tools, think about us as a spoke in that wheel. Like, I don't think it's our job to be the hub, our job, like that's probably a NetSuite job or a, you know, a sales channel job or an SPS commerce job. Our job is to be the best and most modular spoke, which means we should be flexible. We should be integratable, if that's a word, with all of your tools. And we should be able to help you solve your problems in the way that you want to solve them, not just in the way that, hey, this is how we work and this is all we do. So, so think about it in that way. I have a brand, for example, that is using three 3PLs globally. They're based in Europe, um, but they sell a lot in the US and Canada. We do US and Canada for them. They have a preferred 3PL mainland Europe, and then they just started using us for UK. That shouldn't be a huge headache for them. It should be something that's possible because we should be easily able to say, hey, we'll connect with your tools. We'll filter out all orders for mainland Europe and we won't fulfill them. Your other 3PL will fulfill them and it'll all work seamlessly. And if you can't say that, then it's gonna be really hard to scale with a partner. Uh, thank you for that, Kevin. So with that, before I hand it back to Danny, I want to say thank you to all the panelists. Um, I know we're, I've, I've seen some questions coming here in Q&A, so I'm sure we'll hear more from you. But thank you for your time. Thank you for your insight. We really value the partnership with, with each of you and look forward to continuing to see that grow. So with that, I will hand it back to Danny. Thanks, Wes. Uh, and thanks, panelists. That was a, a fantastic conversation. Now, uh, before we jump into the live Q&A, uh, we're going to throw another poll at you to, to get uh, an understanding of some strategic priorities that we uh, all have 
moving into this next year. So go ahead and answer that question. What are some of your top priorities in 2022? And that'll help guide our, our discussion that we have in our live Q&A. And, and I'll say, as we're answering this question, uh, please feel free to throw questions in the Q&A. Again, it's just right on the bottom of your uh, Zoom bar, it should say Q&A. Uh, put those in and, and these fantastic panelists will be able to answer it. So again, uh, make sure you're, you're checking your top business priorities of 2022. I'll give you just a couple more seconds and then we'll uh, release the, the outcome of the poll to see what people are focusing on here. I think that'll help determine some of the answers uh, that we're gonna get. So uh, pretty spread across the board, which is, which is very interesting. Managing inventory more profitably, improving visibility, um, automating order fulfillment process, fantastic. So uh, with that in mind, we're gonna jump into some questions. Uh, we had somebody uh, ask for tips uh, for a brand evaluating a 3PL partner. Uh, I'll, I'll throw it to Kevin first. Kevin, do you have any tips for evaluating a 3PL partner? Yeah, I feel like I just shared a couple of them, so I'm, I'm not gonna double dip, but you know, just to, just to reiterate super quickly, um, ask proactively about hidden fees or future surcharges. Um, ask about the expertise that you don't have but may want, or at least want them to connect you to. Um, the other things that I would say is, is going back to the we're selling trust thing. If you feel like the person that you're talking with, you know, if you just don't have a great feeling about them, that's, I mean, it's weird to say, but it's a big part of building trust is making sure you feel like your, your POC we are going through the sales process with or whatever it is really trustworthy. Um, the other thing that I would say is, uh, oh, I already mentioned the reference call. So ask for references. Um, and then the final thing that I'd say, which probably I, I haven't touched on yet is capabilities. Very, very few 3PLs can do B2B wholesale distribution really, really well, like an A plus effort, as well as direct to consumer really, really well. I think the two on this call are, are, are two of the few. Um, <laughs> Cause it's really hard. They're very different businesses. I mean, even the physical footprint has to be different. Like we have to have lots of cheap, like big warehouses in maybe slightly less expensive real estate areas in order to, to have lots of pallets sitting around to fulfill B2B orders, right? Whereas with direct to consumer, it's much more advantageous to have um, warehouses in areas that are really close to populated Metro centers like New York, New Jersey, or LA. So it's a very disparate sort of game. And if you, um, if you really feel like you need to optimize one way or the other, it's important for you to ask those questions upfront. For example, with direct to consumer, if you need custom packaging, ask a lot of questions about custom packaging. How much does it cost? Is it an extra pick? Do I score it as, store it as a separate line item in the warehouse so I get charged warehousing for it, et cetera? Um, and, or on the D2C side, are you gonna charge me to slap a, a compliant label on a drop shipping order from Target? How much is that? Will you be able to add on new vendors? Which vendors you will add on? You have to be proactive depending on where your the features you're going to need are. If I can just add something on brand that we did, for instance, for the humble company, uh, if if the three PL is actually close to you, go visit it. It's a it's a great way to see what kind of three PL it is, how big the warehouse is. You also sometimes meet the people you're gonna be working with. And I think that sometimes helps get that feeling with, uh, you know, the, the, the manager at the 3PL and uh, if there is, you know, anyone else, your account manager is there. Uh, we did that. Luckily, we're here in, we're in San Diego. So our 3PL is in, in California, Rialto. So we just drove there and we're like, oh, okay, let's meet the whole team. Let's sit down and discuss. And uh, that really helped us a lot also make that decision. Uh, just meeting person to person. I know now with COVID, it's a little bit hard, but um it, it's I, sometimes i think it's great to just to face to face and just talk yeah i, I would say even if they're not that close you mm -hmm. can kind of think like is, is this an investment that you want to make i would say the answer most often than not should be yes um because you know it, even if it's across the country the you know when you look at it at the amount of trust as, as kevin put it that you're buying from them is is substantial so Right. Uh, definitely, um, you know, site visits are, are, are a great idea. All right. Uh, so our next question, uh, I'm going to throw to Wojtek. Uh, somebody is asking, how do 3PLs charge for their services? Are there like monthly minimums? I know Kevin talked about this a little bit, but Wojtek, do you want to uh, jump in on this one? Yeah, I, I want to jump in just because they're, you know, the answer is it depends. 
Uh, that, that is the ultimate answer. There is no standard pricing model in this industry and, and the 3PLs, if you go deep down, I mean, it's a very uncons unconsolidated industry still. There are obviously market leaders, you know, two of which you're, you're seeing here, but there are, you know, thousands of other, um, other 3PLs that are maybe more mom and pop shops or, or smaller, smaller players. Um, and everyone, you know, tends to charge just a little bit differently. Um, so, what I would say as, as a, a way, the best way to approach this is to, um, to really understand you know, all the charges. I think Kevin got into a little bit earlier and, and, and Amar as well. You know, what exactly do you want a 3PL to do for you? And have them price out you know, your typical order, have them price out your most extreme order, have them price out an order that you might have in the future so that you really get an understanding of, of what it is that you're gonna be paying and so that you can actually compare apples to apples. Um, so that's one thing on the services. Um, the other thing that's really important is, you know, of all the spend that you're going to be doing through a 3PL, the services won't be the biggest component. The shipping will likely be the biggest component. So it's also really important to, you know, yes, focus on, on service fees and pick fees and so on, um, but don't get consumed with five cents or 10 cents on a pick fee and ignore shipping completely because shipping is going to be the majority of your spend uh, and really where where you can make a, a really big you know leverage play to to get a reduced total order cost um, you know and, and make that a substantial change to to how much you're actually spending on fulfillment mm -hmm. and sometimes it can get a little bit expensive to work with a 3PL, but it's worth it. So it's not always, you know, finding the cheapest 3PL. It's, you know, because you're so, your price is, but the service is also there. And uh, for instance, we know that we are probably paying a little bit more with for our 3PL on certain areas, but because we know that it will be done quicker, it will be done, you know, in a better way. The communication is better. The flow, it's a lot of times for us brands is, again, that flow. We want to give the 3PL what they're, best let them do what they're best at and we focus on what we're doing best which is you know selling our products and increasing our store counts and being in new retailers and, and things like that so um yeah it's also it's a great it's important to find that balance where of course you know for a brand you're you feel comfortable but you're not giving up you know also the service perfect I think we'll do one last question here. Somebody is asking how important is having real-time freight visibility for the 3PLs and the brands? Kevin, I'll start with you on this one. Yeah, it's very apropos for us. We're, we're starting, we just started a global inventory or global freight program. Um, it's kind of an extension of our core product. The, the challenge with freight guys has always been, you wanna talk about archaic industries that have been slow to catch up. I mean, freight is probably the king of that. Um, so it's, it's really, really challenging. It's a really complicated part of the industry. It's really, um, I don't know how to put this delicately, but it's really, let's just say it's, it's, a, it's opaque. And uh, I have a feeling that a lot of players in the space don't have a lot of vested interest in making it less opaque for customers like us. So what we've done is we just try to take it all in-house. We know that you guys don't wanna deal with it. We will help you book China to US, we'll help you book domestic, we'll cross dock it. So take it to one facility break apart the pallets and then distribute them out. So this is very new for us. It just went into beta right before Q4 last year when the port of Long Beach was a big long line of ships. We decided we needed to do something to help our still customers. Is. Yeah, it was it was really it bad. Still is. It still is. We, we still have uh, ships uh, <laughs> there. Our containers have been there for over a month. <laughs> yeah, and, and there are, what's interesting about that is there are specific strategies that you can use to get around it. But again, it takes scale and volume. It's the arbitrage conversation. Like, Individually, Collier and Amar are going to have less success negotiating with like a flex port or whomever. Hey, get me on a faster, smaller boat so I can skip Port of Long Beach line and go to like, I don't know, Santa Barbara or something. You're not going to have a lot of success there or it's going to be super expensive and you might as well air freight it. But when you work with the 3PL that can use their scale to, to, to negotiate those things, like for example, for us, we have a boat leaving Shenzhen, well, COVID aside, we have a boat leaving Shenzhen every single week with containers dedicated to our merchants. And it's a small boat and it skips that line. So we, we use our scale to negotiate for you. That's, that's really one of the things that I think is most exciting and emergent about the freight industry. Um, the visibility ch challenge is, is still there, um, but the 3PL can help with that ideally if they have that service. 
yeah, I'll 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 just say yeah, we like we we have we have freight you know freight brokerage effectively in house to to help manage some of that um, for for our clients. Um, but it is a it's not a you know when you think of, of FedEx or USPS scanning a package along the route, freight doesn't quite work like that um, in in a lot of cases. So you know it's it would be great to have real time visibility. Um, is is that really something that that we can do right now yeah i think there's there's still a lot of work on as, as kevin said in that industry to to make that happen awesome well we're we're running up against time so i want to thank all the panelists very much for joining us and in, in this fantastic discussion uh so much so that we're going over time a couple quick housekeeping things before we head out keep an eye out for an email from sps as they're gonna send an email uh, asking for a survey if you want to take that right now feel free to uh, scan this QR code. Uh, let us know what you thought, if there's something uh, you wanted to hear more about or less about. Um, and if you do that, we'll, we'll give you five bucks to Starbucks so that next uh, coffee will be on you. And then if you have more questions, please reach out to Megan, Votek, or Kevin, and they'll be able to help answer any more questions that you have. Um, but I do want to make sure that we all get out in time for our happy hour with uh, this St. Patrick's Day. Everyone go drink a Guinness and, and have a lovely rest of your day.